growing up as a child on the river, I didn't have a boat, so I grew up on the banks. And uh, our, we loved to take walks to the river. We always did that every day, got our chores done and took a walk. And we walked single file Indian style. Nobody was allowed to talk. <laughs> the one in the back was my mom, the one in the front was my dad. And we had to step in his footsteps. We weren't to crush plants, we were to watch where we were stepping because you know, we could step on different uh, plants that we didn't want to destroy. So uh, sphagnum moss was walked around. Some of the carnivorous plants we definitely didn't step on. Um, and then uh, I think because I was a very talkative, inquisitive child, uh, the quiet thing was to give my parents a break from my consistent, constant questioning. And um, so we also had to whisper in the Indian mounds. Uh, if you saw something, you put your hand up, everybody stopped and you pointed. Um, so it was a fun childhood. Um, we got to see a lot of things. When I grew up, there were still panthers and bobcats uh, along the Octawaha River floodplain. The Cross Florida Barge Canal was initiated in the 1930s to connect the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico across the state. The project was finally stopped by President Nixon in 1971 due to rising pressure from prominent environmental leaders like Marjorie Harris Carr. Today, what remains are relics of a failed attempt, a series of dams and locks rerouting the flow of water across northern Florida, and a river undoubtedly changed. Cross Florida Barge Canal was a very large impact to our family. and We walked down to see what the latest destruction was. Uh, my mom cried on a stump that they cut down of a huge cypress tree. Um, so I had turbulent times as a child because my dad thought this was a good thing. It would improve the floodplain, drain it, get rid of mosquitoes. He had mosquito phobia from having malaria in the Philippines. But back to your earlier childhood, without a boat growing up as uh, teenagers, and uh, even before we were you know, like 10, 12 years old, uh, we would go to the boat ramps. Uh, at Eureka, the old ones that were still operating right on the river, and help people put their boats in, try to see if we could get a ride further up the river with the, our inner tubes to be dropped out to be floating down. Um, their also favorite thing was just to be there when the fishermen came back and see what they caught and ask what they caught. Um, so most people were out fishing for uh, the panfish, the sunfish family, and bluegills and shell crackers and red breasts, uh, some speckled perch fishing, which I was not aware of when growing up. Um, when one fish I became aware of at a very young age that I didn't know existed in the river was the Atlantic striped bass. And um, one day I saw a boat coming in and it was an impressive boat. It was a big center console. Usually we just had little wooden boats with little tiny kickers as they called them. So to see this big boat on our river was um, kind of strange, you know, so highly curious that I was. I uh, quietly walked over and um, watched them come in and they had this monster ice chest that went all the way across the back of the boat, which I thought was uh, quite interesting. Um, most people didn't even take an ice chest, you know, <laughs> you know so, um, so I uh, waited for a good time and asked, you know, you know, I could see they went fishing, so I asked what they caught. And he goes, oh, we caught striped bass. And I'm like, uh, I didn't say, I didn't know what they were, so I said, you know, can I see them? Can, you know, can you show them to me? You know, what? so they lifted up this ice chest, and I was just astounded. Um, I think I was about 13 years old. And they had caught monster striped bass that pretty much spanned this entire ice chest. And I'm like, wow, you know, and I'm thinking they brought them in from somewhere else. So my next question was, where did you catch this? And they're like, oh, we can't tell you. It's our secret, secret fishing hole. And I'm like, was it on this river? And they're going, oh, OK, I'll t we'll tell you. But you got to keep it a secret. It was down at 40 foot. And I go, oh, yeah, like I knew where 40 foot was, which I didn't really. So I pictured this deep hole, 40 foot deep, big hole that they had caught it on. So I'll never forget the image of those fish and the thought that there was something that big in the river, other than the catfish. I mean, we had big catfish, channel cats and white cats. So, um, 
many years later, I learned 40 foot was a bluff, <laughs> high, high bluff along the river. So, um, but um, so for me to fish, uh, that we started a business in 83 to, to catch fish, take people out family fishing. So to catch a striped bass was very unique at that point in 1983 into the mid 80s. Uh, a lot of sunshine, hybrid striped bass had been introduced and stocked. Um, so quickly they were dwindling down, the catfish were going. For my 16th birthday, I asked my parents to take me for a ride on the river so I could see the fish before they were all gone. Um, and they were very um, happy to do so, except for the shock that they didn't have a boat. So we had to borrow a boat. And it was one of those years when it was crystal clear and the 90 to 100 percent the volume of the, of the river. And it was one of those that I still, you can see it's still a few catfish. There was still quite a few mullet and long nose guard. We had a beautiful sand stretches, uh, beautiful, clear emerald green, deep pools, 20 feet deep in the bends. And it was very interesting to watch all these fish run into these emerald pools in the corner and just sink down below our visibility, which was at that point one of the first times that I guess I felt an invincibility that there were so many big fish in those holes, it was kind of intimidating. So, um, so now when I have to fish for striped bass, I have to go out of the Ocklawa River system and I have to catch them at Salt Springs or out on the Lake George, St. John's River area because they are no longer spawning in the Ocklawaha River. The Rodman Dam has reduced it to nine miles and they needed the entire river so their eggs could float for three days, mature enough to hatch. Um, so we've lost that. They needed the whole 70, to 74 miles, the 72 degree water and one mile an hour current. Um, so I really miss that opportunity to see our lost fish, the striped bass and the catfish and the huge schools of mullet. And when we first started, there was actually redfish at the confluence of the Silver and the Ocklawaha River. So that was, uh, there's a lot of species that we don't even realize are missing today. The Rodman Dam and Reservoir have created a legacy of disappearance, of crystalline springs, of once abundant fish, and of the rich heritage of the Ocklawaha. But it is not too late to restore this important waterway for the animals and people who have made this river their home. It's not too late to free the Ocklawaha.